This is a pressure sensor that I just made. It's based around an MS5611 24-bit pressure sensor. And this thing can sense temperature down to 1 100th of a degree Celsius and pressure down to 1 10,000th of a PSI. And for this display, I'm only having it show three decimal places. And the reason is that uh, it kind of flickers a lot if I had the fourth decimal, decimal place. And I wanted a pressure sensor because I'm building a yeast reactor as part of an aquarium thing <laughs> that I'm building. You can Google what a yeast reactor is to learn more about that. Uh, but I also designed this in such a way that the same design can be used for industrial or scientific purposes. So if you want a quick and easy high precision pressure sensor, this is a good option. So the actual pressure sensor is located in here. This is a syringe, uh, kind of like this. So this is a 10 milliliter syringe. You can get these on Amazon very inexpensively. And they have these convenient little twist connectors. So you can twist anything to the end. And you can also get these blunt needles on Amazon. Uh, and here is a breakout board for the MS5611. And I got this, the breakout board, from icstation.com. And this board is pretty cool. It's a little bit less than $10, and it already has the pressure sensor, which is the small box, the silver device on the very top. And it's broken out so that it can accommodate a 5-volt power supply, and it has all the circuitry it needs so you can just interface it directly with a microcontroller using an I2C interface. So of these four wires coming in, two are power, so plus 5 volts and ground, and the other two are to a two-wire interface, or I squared C. So there's a clock line and a data line. And the um, plastic enclosure is just one of these 10 milliliter syringes cut off with the razor blade. And then I took the little stopper off and inverted it and then filled it with a epoxy that dries hard. So this is a hard plastic that's airtight on top now. So I've got my pressure sensor, wires coming out of it, and an easy connector that lets me connect it to whatever I want. So for this example, I'm just going to connect it to a tube so I can adjust the pressure here and show you what it looks like. So the, uh, the plus sign here shows that it's a positive pressure. It'll turn minus when it goes negative. And this is the pressure in the pressure sensor. So I can kind of slowly increase it. And the bar at the bottom is a bar graph of pressure with respect to the nearest PSI. So if I slowly let go, it goes from 8, it'll go down to 0, and then 7 goes down to 0. So that makes sense. And if I let go, you can see this slowly relax, and the pressure will eventually come back to 0. Uh, for the yeast reactor application, there is a desire that I have to set 0 other than atmospheric 0. So I'll demonstrate that here. Actually, let me go ahead and I'll show you that this can do a vacuum. So if I apply negative pressure, we can see this turns negative and it shows right now we have about negative 2 psi and it's increasing as suction just naturally draws the plunger forward. But I can push this uh, reset button here or the zero button and when I push it it makes that the new zero so as it is equilibrating it actually appears as if it's increasing. So I'll take this out just to kind of reset it hit zero so that's that's a pretty good zero. Um, this thing has a limit, I forget what it is, it's maybe, I think it's two atmospheres of pressure, so about 24 psi. Uh, you're not going to hook this up to a huge high pressure air tank or something like, something like that. But as long as your application calls for precision measurement somewhere around an atmospheric pressure, this is great. Um, I don't know if I can max it out, let me try. Okay, so we've got one full syringe, I'm going to give it a lot of, pre <laughs> a lot of pressure. And, yeah, it looks like it maxes out at about 23 PSI. But, I mean, shoot, that's plenty above what my application is. Uh, so the ports on the side, this USB is not being used for data currently. Right now it's just being used for power. So it's going to any USB port. That gives it the 5 volts it needs to power the screen, the microcontroller inside, and the pressure sensor, which it has some regulation on board that drops it down to 3.3 volts as well. And actually, there's another consideration. Uh, USB power is kind of typically noisy, and this is a precision device. That's another advantage of having this little breakout board. It's pretty convenient because it has the power regulation circuitry on the board. So I don't worry that I'm sending noisy voltages down these wires. It does a pretty good job of cleaning it up at the level of the board. 
Um, and I'm not, for my application, I don't need to log these numbers into a computer. But since we already have a USB interface, it would be extremely easy to do just that. Probably the only difference is the microcontroller inside. I would use the serial transmit pin because um, it just natively supports like a USART serial protocol. I would interface it with a FTDI chip to a USB to serial adapter. And then I could just hook it up to the data plus and minus lines of the USB port. So with no extra connectors, I could make this an active USB device that looks like a serial port to your computer that just continuously dumps these values, if I were interested in that. Um, also, we already talked about what these four lines are, but it's kind of cool because I interfaced this with an Ethernet jack. And this isn't using Ethernet protocol, it's just taking advantage of the twisted pairs to send I squared C over a long distance. And I squared C isn't always trivial to send over a long length of wire, so Google around how to do it. You can get I squared C drivers, and um, in this case, I'm just taking advantage of the twisted pair nature of the cabling to let me have an arbitrary amount of distance between the sensor and the display. So, and then yeah, I have another connector here. So when these are connected, I can sense pressure in real time. Um, I'll also take a second to mention that in order to generate a precise pressure reading, you have to have a precise temperature reading, which is why there's a 24-bit thermometer built into this device. Uh, right from the factory, this device has a calibration memory bank where each device is individually calibrated and things like its offset and its sensitivity and its pressure sensitivity are measured and stored on the chip. So if I power cycle this, you will see a debug message that actually goes really quickly, but it'll say something like C1, C2, C3. Those are the program memory values that were stored at the factory where this was made. And we're going to go through the data sheet and talk about this in a little more detail. But I'll power cycle it here so you can see. Yeah, so those six values help take the 24-bit number from pressure and temperature. And by running it through an equation, which is also listed in the data sheet, you can generate a very precise pressure measurement uh, using the pressure and temperature readings off of here. So let's go into a little more detail, and I'll show you the design considerations behind how I actually built this, and show you how to interface the pressure sensor directly with a bus pirate, which is pretty cool. We don't need to have any custom programmed microchips for that. Uh, we can interface, interface this directly with a bus pirate, poke around, probe some of its data, and then record and plot some of its data using Python in real time. And we can also sniff around and observe the protocol using a logic analyzer. So this video, rather than just demonstrating what this does, also will go through and show a little bit of a step-by-step -step on how I designed a microchip to interface the sensor. So let's take a closer look. So my first goal was to interface this device with the computer. And the breakout board came fully assembled, and I just stuck it in the tube, added the piece of rubber, and then acrylic on top. So this is hard. And I just connected to four of the wires. There are some extra connectors, but for this application, they weren't needed. Uh, it's a little bit hard to read back in there, but the only wires from top to bottom are VCC, or power, which I'm giving 5 volts, ground, or GND, and then SCL, which is a clock line, and SDA, which is a data line. And that's clock and data for a two-wire interface, or I squared C. So after I had wired to those four things, I just connected those four wires to an Ethernet port. And I made every other pin ground so that all of these twisted pairs are twisted with ground. And I only connect ground on one side of the connection. Um, but again, you can Google for how to use twisted pair to send I squared C over a moderate distance. Um, and these connectors are pretty easy to obtain. And then I added a little bit of hot glue to prevent it from pulling up. So this is my development cable. It just goes straight through to some headers like this. And then I can insert the headers. And I added little labels so you can see there's in the same order, plus ground, clock, and data. And then those wires, I'm going to connect to my bus pirate. 
So this is a bus pirate. Um, I forgot exactly what version it is. They come out with new versions every once in a while, but for basic operation, they pretty much all work the same. Um, and I'm connect. I have a little cheat sheet here that is the same wiring as the bus pirate pinout here, and I connect to this five volts ground uh, SCK or SCL for the clock, and then SDA for the data. And this was obtained just from the website that documents the bus pirate. And then I plug it into USB, plug it into my computer, and this is all I'm going to need to be able to use my computer to talk with this pressure sensor. So let's take a look. Um, and actually, the way this works is it's it's two chips. Um, well, it's three chips, but gosh, it's, <laughs> it's more if you consider those chips. But it pretty much is a USB serial converter. So this is seen to your computer as a serial port, but it lets you use the serial protocol to interact with the PIC microcontroller, which can send I squared C commands to and from other devices. So we're going to go through, look at the data sheet, figure out what type of commands we would expect to send to get meaningful data from this, and actually poke around sending commands to the bus pirate to try to get these two devices talking to each other. So let's get started. So this is the device that I'm actually using. This is from icstation.com, and it is an MS5611 pressure sensor breakout board. And its intended use is as an altitude sensor. This is so precise that it can measure the changes in air pressure down to uh, 10 thousandth of a PSI, which can give you a altitude res resolution of about 20 centimeters. So for designing quadcopters or altitude sensors and cell phones, things like that, this temperature pressure sensor would be great. Uh, my application is a little bit different, but I can certainly utilize the small form factor, the convenient circuit which exists in the breadboard and um, yeah so this is great and the price is less than 10 bucks for this really high quality sensor so we'll scroll down and look a little bit closer uh, it shows the dimensions of the breakout board and this is what I'm really interested in we zoom in a little bit and see the extra circuitry on the board so it has a linear voltage regulator which can help drop the 5 volts down to 3.3 volts and this Regulator in combination with the capacitors really does a good job at smoothing out a lot of the power supply ripple on the 5 volt rail. So a 5 volt rail of USB line is kind of notoriously dirty, but I can say with moderate confidence that even powering this directly from a 5 volt USB rail will produce a smooth enough power that we can get meaningfully good uh, resolution and low noise from our pressure sensor. Uh, it also has a power LED here. And then the these are level uh, translators, so my microcontroller is going to be powered on the 5 volt rail, not 3.3 volts. So as a result, all of the pins, when they're high and low, are going between 5 volts and 0 volts. They are not the 3.3 volt level that the pressure sensor would expect. So this circuitry here uh, bidirectionally allows the um, data line and the clock line to be pulled low and they translate the level from 5 volts to 3.3 volts so that's convenient to have. Uh, we have extra connectors which we're not going to really worry about but this lets us do things like change our I squared C address. And then this is the actual MS5611 pressure sensor. It's hooked up with its necessary power line. It has some decoupling uh, so to further reduce noise on the power rail right next to the chip and that's pretty much everything. So let's scroll down see, yeah, that's, that's pretty much all we need to know to get started. I was also able to pull the data sheet for this device, and the actual core device is this small silver device right here. All this extra stuff is additional circuitry that we just looked at. Um, the data sheet is kind of a moderate length, but it goes through all the necessary details to figure out how to interact with it. So for example, these are all the commands which you can send. This starts to get a little bit complicated, but we'll, we'll work through it a little bit at a time. Um, it shows you how to make a conversion, so how to measure temperature and pressure, and also how to read some of the uh, program memory which exists on the chip for calibration. And it also has an example circuit diagram and all that. So with this, this should be enough to get us started, uh, but let's not dive too deep into the data sheet yet. Let's start with a program 
called serial term. Or actually, no, this is called real term. So I just opened this program. Uh, this will let me interface the bus pirate over the USB line, which really is just kind of a USB serial converter. And that's connected to the I squared C lines of the pressure sensor. So hopefully we can get some information out of it using this guy. So the first thing I'll do is I'll switch from ASCII to ANSI. This is what the bus pirate expects. And then I will tell it which port to use. Uh, I happen to know from just a little bit of trial and error and experience that this number three device is the device that the bus pirate lives on. So it, if I send a question mark, ooh, that's not looking good. Oh, I didn't set the bot, the bot rate appropriately. The bot for the bus pirate should be 115,200. So I'll set that, hit change, hit question mark. Yeah, so now this is the interface for the bus pirate. And the bus pirate is pretty cool. Um, so I'll give you a quick demonstration of how we get started. The first thing I'll do is I'll just reset everything. So, ah, that's not looking good. Let's clear. So a pound will reset everything. And then a question mark will give us the main menu, which will show all the things we can do. Uh, so the before I do anything, what I want to do is tell the bus pirate that we intend to communicate with I squared C. So I'm going to do this M key to change the mode. If I push M, it'll say, what do you want to do? You are at I squared C, SPI, etc. Let's do I squared C. So number four. And then what speed? This doesn't really matter that much. I have a relatively short run of cable, but just for convenience, I'll pick three. So we're going to run I squared C at 100 kilohertz. And that's ready. That's all it takes. Uh, so nothing's happened so far. I'm going to go to the main menu by hitting question mark, see what we have available. Um, the first thing I need to do is I need to enable power to the device. So by default, the device is powered off. I can use this lowercase w or uppercase w to turn the PSU on or off. And that will engage or disengage the 5 volt and or 3.3 volt lines. And I have this hooked up to the 5 volt line. So we'll hit a capital W and see what happens. Okay, and the light came on, that's a good sign. That means that we have power on our board. So the next thing we need to do is enable the pull-up resistors for I squared C. Uh, this might not be necessary if there are already pull-up resistors on the board, uh, but in this case, it, it doesn't hurt to add an additional level of pull-up resistors. So let's do capital P, pull-up resistors on, great. And if that failed, it would have actually given us a, an error. It would have said, hey, we weren't able to pull up this data line, etc." So So far, so good. Um, the next thing I want to do is scan for I squared C addresses. And I can do that using this command here. This is the number one in parentheses. And all of this walkthrough, I squared C walkthrough, can be found on the Dangerous Prototypes website. They're the group that makes the bus pirate, and they have some good documentation there. So if I do that, we see all the I squared C devices, and it only found one on the address 0xee. So from here on, we're going to practice talking to the device on 0xee. Okay, so the next step is going to be to go back to the data sheet and take a look at how we interact with this thing using I squared C. So let's scroll down through the data sheet, see what we can find. All right, there are only five basic commands. Reset, reading the program memory, D1 and D2 conversion, which uh, through reading the rest of the data sheet, you eventually realize D1 and D2 are temperature and pressure readings. And so the conversion sort of makes the measurement and loads it into the program memory of the MS5611. And then after it's been converted into the program memory, then we can read the analog to digital conversion result as a 24-bit pressure or temperature result using a read command. So that's, that's important. Um, if we're going to measure temperature, we've got to do a D1 conversion and then a reading the result. And then to measure pressure, we do a D2 conversion and then reading the result. But those are the five basic commands. So we'll scroll down some more. And this looks like a lot, but uh, let's just step through this real quick. This is the formula of how to get all of the readings from the factory programmed calibration variables and combine them with the D1 and D2, which is the pressure and temperature values. Um, I guess I said those backwards earlier. And mix all those together to eventually get temperature compensated pressure down to 1 one hundredth of a millibar resolution. So um, yeah, so these are the six C1 through 
C6, and I think in the earlier part of the video you saw this being displayed on the screen. Um, there are the pressure sensitivity offset, ten temperature sensitivity offset, and then reference, you know, it, it doesn't actually really matter the details of that. Just assume that we can read these six values from the memory, we can read these two values from the memory using a conversion, and then we really just use these equations right here to get a calibrated temperature reading. So the first thing we do is we calculate this dt value, and it's pretty much d2 minus c5 times 2 to the 8, where this is c5, and this is d2, so that's pretty easy. And then the actual temperature is 2000 plus this dt times c6 divided by 2 to the 23. And if you do all that, you'll actually get the temperature as a number with 1 one hundredth of a degree Celsius resolution. And then we can use that temperature, plugging it into these formulas to get pressure. And we don't really need to go through in that much detail. C2, that's just from up here. Um, C2 times 2 to the 16 plus C4 from up there, times DT, which is here, all divided by 2 to the 7. That'll give us our actual offset temperature. And then we use this. It's going to go down in this formula. But we also need this sense actual temperature, which is calculated with this. So C1 from above times 2 to the 15 plus C3 from above, times DT, which we got up here, all <laughs> over 2 to the 8. Okay, it's pretty much plug and chug, nothing too crazy. So D1, digital pressure value, times sense, which is this, over 2 to the 21, minus the off temperature, all that over 2 to the 15. And yeah, if you do all those things in order, read all these numbers correctly, and then just plug and chug, you will get an accurate temperature and pressure. So let's see if we can start interacting with the uh, microchip using the bus pirate to pull some of these C and D values. So we'll scroll down a little bit more and see. Ah, here we go. Okay, so this tells us how we actually get our D1 and our D2 values. So remember, D1 and D2 are pressure and temperature. And there are a few different commands. So this is the command, and they show it in hex to get D1 and D2 with these different OSR values. The OSR values are different levels of precision. A high, The highest level of precision and accuracy is uh, requires the highest OSR value, and it also requires the greatest current to measure. So let's just look where else in the data sheet it talks about OSR. Um, here we go. So, um, and also it takes a little bit more time. That's important to note. So if, we, if you need to do a really fast, oh here we go. So a larger sample OSR requires a greater degree of current than a slower one. So if you're oper operating on battery power, you only need a quick and dirty measurement. You probably don't need to use the full OSR. And uh, what else do we have here? So the resolution also is more precise with a higher OSR than with a lower OSR. But since we're running on wall power or USB power, it doesn't really matter. So let's just assume we're always going to use the highest OSR value. So what we are really interested in is this D1 value and this D2 value. And the number is 0x48 and 0x58. So 0x48 in, let's just see what that looks like. That's 72. Um, so we could enter hex commands directly into the bus pirate, but actually, shoot, let's go ahead and do that. So we decide we want 0x48. So we're going to try to read D1. So this is, a, this is important. So remember earlier, let's go back up. Uh, we have to do a conversion and then reading. So if we're going to read the pressure, we have to do the conversion first and then the reading. So this will just do the conversion. So 0x48 should do conversion. And then we have to do the reading, which is ADC read, which is just 0. So that's pretty easy. So let's just slide this over here. Hey, that worked pretty well. Hmm. Good enough. OK. So what was that? 0x48. So, okay, so we're right back where we left off. I'm going to try to send a command to 
this 0xEE device. And the way you do that is you start by saying 0xEE, and then you can send the command. So in this case, we're going to do 0x48. That will do the conversion. Cool. So 0xEE, 0x00. That should do the ADC read. So now, <laughs> now it's ready to be displayed. Um, and then to actually read it, we send, shoot, what is it? I think it's like 0xEFR colon 2. Yeah, so these are our two values. So these two values represent, I guess we needed 24 bit, so we need three. Oh, okay, so they reset. So I'm gonna push the upper row and do these all again. Cool, so here are our three values that we got out. So again, we started by sending 0x48 to tell it to do a conversion from D1, and then we sent 0x00 to tell it that we want to do an ADC read, and then we actually used this 0xEF command, and it's always the address plus one to do a read. Uh, we used the 0xEF command, and then we read three bytes in a row, and these are the three bytes, so 08, 062, and 0x14. And my suspicion is that if I read them again, there'll be different numbers. So let me try again, 0x48, 0x00, read three, and yeah, indeed they are. So I wonder if we can expand this a little bit. <laughs> I think I might have lost what it was before. But the bottom line is that these numbers are a little bit different. So we are able to read D1 that way, and we can read D2 the same way. So that's pretty easy. I'm going to go back to the main menu here. And I guess just to be thorough, let's demonstrate how we can read the program memory. So remember in these formulas, wherever they are. Yeah, in these formulas we have these C1 through C6 values. Those can be read with the program ROM read and we can address those six values by changing these three bits in this byte command. So we'll start just with A0 I guess and see what happens. So it should be as easy as telling it that we'll send it A0 and then we'll just read a byte. So 0x a 0 and then instead of reading three bytes we'll read one byte and there it is. So I don't know, I don't know if that worked. Uh, let's actually <laughs> let's do the other end. Let's try AE and see what that looks like. Yeah okay so we got it we got to read. So my guess is that if all of these are 000, zero, zero is probably not going to be a meaningful read. So let's take a look. Yeah, that's a 16-bit reserved from the, from the manufacturer. And actually, shoot, let's take a look again. These are expecting 16-bit unsigned integers. So we should be able to read two bytes. So let's try to read this ADD1 value. So we'll go back here. A0 was the manufacturer reserved, so we're going to want to do a couple above that. So instead of A0, we'll do A2, and then we will read two bytes, and there you go. We got AD and 0x91, and I bet if we do that twice in a row, we will get the same result. And yeah, as, as expected, we do. So this is how we can read the program memory that helps us get our values between like A2 and AE, which are the six calibration values, which will eventually get saved in the C1 through C6. So I think we've gone through and shown how we can use the bus pirate to make a conversion to pull data from the chip and display it through this serial interface here. So the next step will be to demonstrate how we can do this repetitively and kind of automate it to capture data and log data in real time with Python. And before I go any further, I want to remind everyone that this code is available on my GitHub. Uh, so the easiest way to find it is just to Google SW Harden AVR GitHub, and you'll find 
this project. This is the AVR projects project on GitHub, and it has a whole bunch of individual projects, and they're organized kind of alphabetically by what microcontroller I use. So this one is probably going to live somewhere in the bus pirate. I haven't uploaded it yet, um, but there will be a link on my website, which you can find more information there at swharden.com. So for now, uh, I'm going to open my editor. I'm using Spider, which right now I'm on a Windows system, and I can't remember if I'm using Win the WinPython distribution, Anaconda, or if this is just a base install of Python. But you know what? It doesn't really matter. This is just a Python 3. And um, so I wrote a library called Bus Pirate. I might be changing uh, the name of it. I don't want to cause any uh, disagreements as to who owns the rights to Bus Pirate and all that. But for now, let's say I wrote a library called Bus Pirate, and it lets us easily interact with the Bus Pirate using the serial interface. Uh, and pi serial and all of that. So um, remember earlier we used real term to send these commands. So 0xee72. 72 is 0x48. So this was like a convert d1 and then this was read the ADC. And then this command was to actually pull three bytes. And uh, so this bus pirate this is so weird. Oh, here, yeah. Bus pirate. Bus pirate. Um, this bp.i2c read is a function that I wrote to let us read three bytes from i squared c interface. Uh, so, yeah, this this really isn't. I don't know. This isn't necessary to go through all this detail, try all this code. I just want to show how you can use the bus pirate in its uh, kind of full text serial mode to pull data that gets logged. The Bus Pirate does have a cool binary mode, but some of the older versions of Bus Pirate people have indicated have some glitches or bugs in there, and it's always not intuitive to know exactly how to interact with it. So since we already know how to interact with the Bus Pirate just by sitting on the keyboard banging these commands, it's easy enough just to use PySerial to send these commands to a serial port. So this program actually starts here. It opens a file, which is going to live here. And it, our goal is just to log data and temperature. So let's take a look at what that looked like. Um, the output will look like this. Here's a timestamp in seconds. This is temperature in Celsius, and then this is pressure in millibar, I think. Um, so let's step through this program. This starts, this opens that file, gets it ready for writing. This initializes the bus pirate. This will also connect to it and make sure it can talk back and forth and that type of thing. Um, I squared C setup is what we need to do to turn the power on, so capital W, raise the pull-up resistors, capital P, and also set the mode to I squared C, probably set it to like 100 kilohertz or something like that. Um, so that's what that does. And then prom gets the program memory. It runs this function up here, and it just pulls the first seven bytes from this memory address. So exactly what we did earlier by hand, it just says it automatically, and it returns an array of the first certain number of uh, programmable memory values. Uh, so let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and load up the data sheet again. That was useful. Okay, so here's that data sheet. Remember <clears throat> when we were going to calculate pressure and temperature, we use these values, so like D1, D2, and the C1 through C6. The program that we're looking at now reads all of these six values, and it saves them for later, because these will never change. And then it reads D1 and D2 over and over, and then it runs this math here to calculate the actual values. So let's look at what that looks like. Um, we only once have to get the program memory, and then while true means it'll do this forever, and it really just does this little block here. So it gets the temperature from get temp, which is, again, this is just like we did manually with the bus pirate, send this command, this command. So prepare to get D2, make the read, read three bytes, and then return its value. So get the temperature, get the pressure, and we can do this at the same time here. So DT is something that we need. Um, 
dt, you get dt here. And then temp, something we need, temp here. These are just straight from the data sheet. And at the very end, we have our final temperature and our pressure, and they should be accurate. So I'm just going to go ahead and run this program, and it just starts going. Now I'm going to click stop so we can scroll back up. Uh, oh, goodness. I'll do control C. Stop. <laughs> I think I, uh, I think I took out something that we needed. So let me add that here and see what happens. Okay, cool. So I was able to use Control C to stop it. Um, but yeah, it just continuously reads temperature, pressure, temperature, pressure, temperature, pressure. And I'm not going to go through the effort of like squeezing the tube, but you know, take my word for it. These numbers change. Uh, with temperature and pressure. Um, but let's scroll up a little bit and see how this thing initialized the bus pirate. So it automatically scanned the COM ports, it found one that looked like it had a bus pirate on it, so it automatically opened it, it knows the baud to use, and it tried the m command. Okay, so we started here. So it's doing this I squared C setup. So it knows to run the m command. And then, yeah, this is a little bit of out of order, but I think this is the prompt, and this is the command that was run, and then this is the output. So then it's going to say number four, which is I squared C. Pretty much it just goes through and automates what we would push if we just sat there pushing buttons. And yeah, see, it, it found an I squared C address at 0xee. And then the rest isn't really being shown, the commands go back and forth, but really it's exactly the same. It types these commands, and then it uses some text parsing to pull these numbers on the output. Um, so I'm going to let this run a few more times. And actually I will take this opportunity to, I'm going to hold the temperature sensor in my hand, and as I'm holding it you should see this number start to rise. And I'll also kind of try to put a little bit of pressure on it just by pushing my thumb in the syringe a little bit. Okay, and now I'm going to let, let go of it. <clears throat> and it's a kind of large thermal mass, so it doesn't surprise me that it's still heating up after I, after I let go. Um, but that's that's enough just to show what we're trying to show here. And let's see if it saved it. So rather, well, I guess I can go ahead and open this. And it has about 200 lines in here, so that seems right. And it was modified at this time. So I also added another program, this pressure plot. And this program just reads the values from this CSV file. And on top, we have the temperature. And on the bottom, we have pressure. You can see the pressure spiked when I pushed my thumb in and out of the syringe. And somewhere around here is where I grabbed the whole syringe and it started heating up. So this is kind of a cool way. Using nothing but the breakout board and a bus pirate, we can get really high resolution, precise temperature and pressure data straight into a computer. And uh, this would be kind of cool to do with something like a Raspberry Pi. They actually have I squared C pins on the header of the Raspberry Pi, so you wouldn't even need a bus pirate. All you would need is this little pressure sensor breakout board. So now that we've seen how this works, let's bump it up a notch and interface this directly with a microcontroller. Actually, before we try to interface this with a microcontroller, let's take a closer look at the protocol that's being used when we communicate with the sensor using the bus pirate. So we have the exact same circuit that we had earlier with the bus pirate just being wired straight through to the device. It's even getting its power from the bus pirate. And then I dropped in this uh, little USB logic analyzer. These are really inexpensive and can be found on eBay. And I'll show you how the software works in a little bit. Uh, this is a 16-channel <laughs> logic analyzer, but obviously I'm not using all of them. I'm just going to probe the two channels that we're interested in, which are the I squared C clock and data. So now that those are connected, I'm running the software that you saw earlier. It's the same software that just continuously reads temperature and pressure, and we can start sniffing the protocol. The ultimate goal, actually, of doing this is so that when we start developing for the microcontroller, 
If we run into any problems, we know what the protocol is supposed to look like. And if the microcontroller is not communicating like this is, then we can do whatever is necessary on the microcontroller side to fix it. I found this was actually really helpful because my microcontroller code wasn't working right off the bat. So I had to go back to this level, checking it out with the logic analyzer, and seeing what the microchip was doing wrong. And ultimately, I figured out it was a really simple problem, but it's kind of helpful sometimes just to take a look at the protocol with logic analyzer at various steps along the way. OK, so this software is still running. We are continuously recording data, which means we're continuously communicating over I squared C using the bus parrot. So I'm going to open up the logic analyzer software. OK. I'm going to resize it here so it looks good on my screen capture. And I would encourage anyone who is interested in doing any of this professionally to buy one of the professional units that comes with the software. The software is free and open source. This is really fantastic and convenient software. Um, it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's a little bit convenient, but also disappointing that really inexpensive hardware clones are available on eBay. Um, I don't do any type of electronic stuff professionally, so um, I felt okay when I'm just poking around uh, to try it out, you know, try out the hardware I was able to get online. But if this were something I did professionally or for profit, or if anyone else is considering doing this type of thing, um, I would recommend investing in this company by buying one of their endorsed hardware units. I'm sure you'll get better support, a little extra, um, some extra features in there. So. Yeah, so with that being said, let's just go ahead and continue here. Um, I've already programmed it so it knows channel 0 is the clock and data is on channel 1. And it knows to be looking for I squared C. And again, this is just continuously running in the background. So let's take a look at what happens. Um, it's been a while since I used this. We're just going to record one second of data, channel 0 and 1, and it's set between 3.6 and 5 volts, so that looks good. So I'll just hit start. Got a whole bunch of samples, and wow, cool. So I can zoom in and out, and we can see this is these. Okay, let's back up a little bit and talk about I squared C. Uh, these lines, if no data were being sent, I kind of want to simulate it, but you, I'm sure you can get the picture. If no data is being sent, it's like this, where both of these lines are high. Uh, only when data starts to be sent and received are these lines pulled low and either the microchip can pull it low like the the host the microcontroller or the slave so the sensor in this case can pull it low so this lets you communicate bidirectionally um, there if we consider the software when we do like get pressure it does three commands it does this 72 command this zero command, and then it reads three bytes. And there's a little bit of a delay between each of these three because it's interacting slowly over the serial protocol. So it doesn't surprise me at all that we see our data in three little bursts. So let's take a closer look. What, can we change it to show hex? Yeah, OK, there we go. All right, 0xee, that's what I expected, and then 0x58, let's look at the next one, 0x00, 0xee. So that 58, I'll bet it was one of the one of those two commands we're interested in. So let's just keep, keep going here. What's the next one? All right, so now this is getting fancy, 0xef. So we're going to be getting three bytes afterwards, and yeah, that's what we get. So remember... EF was um, when we're going to be reading from the sensor, that's what gets sent. And then 0x81, 0x23, 0xe6. That's the actual data coming back from the sensor. So this is pretty straightforward. Um, you can just glance at this and get an idea of what the protocol should be looking like. So if you code this to work with a microcontroller and the microcontroller is not working, you can probe the lines and see if it looks like this or doesn't look like this. So that's pretty much all I need to do here. Uh, let's take the next step and work on designing this with a microchip so we can interact with it without using a computer. 
So I'm not going to walk you through all the way I designed and built all of this. There are a lot of pictures of the build process, but I will say I started with this aluminum enclosure. It's pretty cool. They have these little teeth, which makes it easy for them to mesh together. And they have front panels, which just slide over and can get screwed in. And this is made of aluminum, so it's really easy to drill. And it's easy to use a nibbler to cut out like square holes and stuff like that. So that was my starting point. And rather than walk you through every step of the build process, I'll just kind of take this apart and show how that works. I'll adjust my camera here. Um, OK, so actually, I will mention that the uh, these little labels, they look really good, but all they are are just standard labels from a label maker. But instead of a white background, it is a transparent background. And I enabled the setting that makes it print a black square around the edges. So if you carefully cut around the black square and stick it to your metal case, it actually looks pretty good. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, so I'm glad I like the way that came out. I'm going to add a link to that on the project page. Also, I want to have a huge shout out to whoever it was who made these little bezels for the LCD screens. Um, let's see, I think I have an LCD screen here. OK, so these are these really standard uh, Hitachi type LCD screens, and you know everyone uses these things all the time. They're extremely inexpensive, especially from China. We're talking like one or two dollars each. They're usually about 16 characters wide by two characters high. Um, you can get them in a various different dimensions. I don't have any floating around right now, but I have some that are like four rows high by 20 wide. Um, and they communicate with a lot of pins, though. So you're going to need about six or eight free pins on a microcontroller if you're going to interface a screen like this. And more if you want to control the backlight with software. Um, something else that some people make on eBay, and there are just a whole bunch of these, are I2C controllers for these displays. So you can control the display with only two wires, which is pretty cool. Um, the advantage is simplicity. So now, instead of having a big ribbon cable going to a bunch of pins on your, on your microcontroller, you can just drop this on your I2C line, which in the case of this project is already existing. The microcontrollers are already using I2C. The downside is that you have to have a little bit more advanced software running on the microcontroller. There's potentially an extra layer of debugging. And also, since you're doing like a serial to parallel conversion, essentially, you have to send a lot of serial data to get one clock flip on the output of this parallel data. So for updating a screen like this at high speed, you're going to be limited if you use a chip like this. Um, for this type of ac application, it's fine, especially because the character display of this LCD doesn't update very quickly. Um, but it is worth noting that I pretty much am maxing out the uh, speed at which I'm updating this display. Let's see if I can plug this back in. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's still plugged into the computer. OK, let's take another look here. I'm going to hook it up to a pressure source. Um, something's wonky here. Let me reset it. OK, there we go. Uh, yeah, so the limiting factor of this update here is actually not the rate of the sensor. This sensor has the capability to have even faster updates. We can update more than this frame rate just from the sensor. The limitation here is how fast I can send all of the screen data to the screen over this I squared C adapter. So I'll add a link to that. But OK, I got off topic. These uh, LCD modules are fantastic, and they have a standard form factor. These screws are in the same place, no matter what brand they are. So there's this guy on. Tendi, well, actually, I don't know if it's a guy. I don't know who it is. <laughs> but I'll definitely add a link to it. This is the first time I've used these. They're fantastic. Um, yeah, actually, I'm going to go I'm gonna go grab some so I can show you what they look like. OK, uh, so this is how they come. Actually, just, just one is needed here. Um, yeah, so these are little bezels for the LCD display. And it makes it so nice and professional looking to mount a character LCD on your board. And it's just a piece of acrylic. Um, but it's already pre-cut out, and the kit comes with little mounting screws. So you can just make a square cut in any piece of metal or plastic or whatever, 
Um, I use a nibbler to do that, and it doesn't even have to be a perfect square. It can be all jagged and everything. Um, mounting these LCDs can sometimes be hard, and there are some pictures of old projects I've made, really kind of clever projects, but they look so bad because the quality of the mounting of the LCD just wasn't on point. Um, but these bezels really make a difference. So big shout out to the person who develops these as well. Uh, I have a project that is like in the early stage of work, but so there's this kind of big case here, and there is a screen on the front, and it looks really nice. And that's just a character LCD with that same driver on the front, and these bezels make a big difference. So, okay, so I'll stop talk talking about those for a little bit. Um, in order to understand how this works, rather than showing the build process, I'll show you sort of like the uh, deconstruction process. So, uh, we saw those enclosures. I just unscrewed the screws on the top on both sides, and this just kind of rocks out. So, there's my I squared C converter, and this is really simple. It's just four wires two are for power, and two are for clock and data. And the microcontroller I'm using is an AT Mega 328. I don't know how well it shows up there. Yeah, an AT Mega 328, and I probably could have made something a little bit simpler, but this is this is fine, and I had a box of these. Um, and the circuit is just incredibly, incredibly simple. Um, I'll grab a pointing object. So I'm going to be pulling power directly off USB. So we have power, positive power is this one. It goes here. There's a little bit of a decoupling capacitor here just to smooth out power a little bit more. And ground goes across here. Ground goes here. Ground goes straight to the microcontroller. And then the microcontroller is powered through this 5 volt rail, but it goes through a series uh, inductor. It's really more of like an RF choke. And that, in combination with the parallel capacitor to ground, um, it, <clears throat> it uh, just helps smooth the power a little bit. And gosh, that's that's it. I mean, there is not a lot in here. Uh, we have like a 47k ohm resistor in series with an LED. Just you know, while I'm working on it to know that it's powered up, no one can see the LED when the screen's closed. And then the top two pins here are clock and data for I squared C, which is just natively supported by this microcontroller. And I am using two 10k resistors to pull them high. So both pins are pulled through the resistors to the 5-volt rail, and then these two wires just go straight to two connectors on this Ethernet connector. And I added, well, okay, so the first thing I did was I cut out square holes here and here with a nibbler, and then I lined up the connectors, and then I used a really hard acrylic, or a hard like epoxy, to get this in place. And then in the case of this Ethernet connector, since I had some small flimsy wires going to it, I added hot glue just to kind of keep everything in place. Uh, but that's really everything. Um, the only other thing is this switch, which helps with the reset. So you can probably see the screen up there. If I push it, it does a baseline reset. The microcontroller between each read looks at the voltage on this pin. And the voltage should always be 5 volts. And you can see there's this series resistor to the positive rail. It's probably like 10k. I can't really read it from here. Um, but this will always, so the yellow wire is what takes it over here, and it should always be 5 volts. However, when you push the button, it shorts this little circuit, and it pulls it down to 0 volts, so if the microchip sees 0 volts on that pin, it knows a reset is in order. Uh, I can't remember if I mentioned it earlier or not, but there right now is no data being sent from the microcontroller to the computer, so this USB is just being used for power. However, it would be just trivially easy to be able to log temperature and pressure data on the computer because we have a few extra pins here that are used for transmission and reception of serial data. And I think I've got one here, yeah. So we, this is an example of a serial to USB adapter, essentially. This is an FTDI little chip that if you plug in a USB port here, it looks like a USB serial port. And this might actually be the exact same chip that's on the bus pirate. I haven't looked at it too closely. But it's just a really convenient, easy, just drop it in your circuit. It doesn't need special drivers or stuff like that. Drop it in your circuit, and then this USB plug would be able to see a COM port, like a serial COM port. Those serial wires could be connected to the microcontroller, and then you could just 
effortlessly get data off the microcontroller. So I think that's about everything involving the construction. So this is the system that I'm going to be working with, and I don't have the yeast reactor set up yet, so all the equipment right now is below the tank, and for now I'm interfacing my pump inlet here, and I've drilled a hole, added epoxy, so I have a airtight hose going down behind the tank, and now underneath the tank, lighten up the video a little bit. Um, underneath the tank we have this cord coming in and it's pretty cool because this is just standard aquarium air hose and it kind of perfectly fits the little inner ring of these 10 milliliter syringes. So give it a little pressure that should stay. Um, that's hooked up obviously using the ethernet cable to this device and I haven't figured out its final location but for testing this is pretty good right now. And you can see that it's exactly what we would expect for suction. Right now showing about negative 0 0.163 PSI. And again, ultimately the goal is to interface this with a yeast reactor, which will live down here. But for now, I think proof of concept indicates that everything's working. And the aquarium just has to uh, wait now <laughs> for me to figure out the biological side of the yeast reactor. But that's a pretty cool project start to finish and it looks like it's working pretty well.